Hey church, great to see you this morning or whatever time of day you find yourself tuning in for church online. We're so pleased you could be with us. Before we get into the service, we are going to pray together. Now, for some of you, prayer may be something that is a last resort, perhaps when you're on your knees and really desperate. For others of you, prayer is something you do all day, all the time, very intentionally. So wherever you find yourself, let's believe with faith that God is listening and can meet all of our needs. So let's pray for the needs in our church, of our church right now. 
Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for who you are. Lord, we thank you that you see us all and you love us all uniquely and individually. Heavenly Father, you know the needs of people in our worlds right now, our friends, our family members, our work colleagues, whether it's a need for healing, it's breakthrough financially, it's restoration in relationships, whether it's salvation, God, and relationship with you. We just lift it all up to you right now, God. We're expecting for you to meet those needs, God, to touch people's lives, Lord. Have them have an encounter with you, and we just give you all the glory and the praise. Amen. Amen. How are you doing, Follow? Great, thanks. And yourself? I'm really good, really good. Yeah. We've got so much exciting happening in the life of church, and one thing that's coming up next week is Easter weekend. Now, as a church, we are going to be gathering across all of our locations on Easter Sunday, uh, and let me encourage you, do what you can to be in the room. It's going to be a really special Sunday, not just for our church, but the church globally. It's so central to our faith. And also on Good Friday, we're going to have an online service available from 9 a.m. So wherever you find yourself, whether you're at home enjoying a day off on the bank holiday or you're having to work and you're on your, on your way to work, wherever you find yourself, that service is going to be available to you to hop on so that right across the UK, we can gather and just have a time together, bringing our focus to Jesus at the start of Good Friday. So I'm excited for that one. I hope you are too. And more exciting news, the following Sunday, Sunday the 24th of April, we have got a big unveiling of our building in North London, our North London location in Golders Green. It's going to be an exciting time for us as a church, so please, please pray into it and be in the room if you can as well. We'll have three services. Um, all the information you need is on our website, but if you normally come to the Dominion Central London location on a Sunday, please don't come that day. Go to Golders Green instead or see you online. Amazing. And uh, in this moment in the service is where we come around our tithes and offerings. And there'll be different ways that you can give on the screen below me right now. Um, and what is the tithe? The tithe, it literally means a tenth. And the principle of the tithe is the biblical principle that we bring the first 10% of all that we earn back to God as a, a recognition and just acknowledgement that actually ultimately everything that we have comes from Him in the first place. And I don't know about you, but I like to think of the tithe as not a rule to follow, but actually a gift from God to us. Uh, money can so often be something that causes worry, anxiety, or it's something that we can chase above God and have. it can often get more attention in our minds than God himself. And the principle of the tithe is just an opportunity for us to choose, you know what, God, I'm going to put you first above my finances. I don't trust my own power through money, but I trust you as my provider. And so wherever you are today, um, take your giving in your phone, or if you giving via direct debit um, just have that in mind as we pray and we just fix our eyes on God in this moment so God I thank you so much that we can partner with you in this way Lord I just pray that as we bring our tithes and offerings today Lord I thank you that you are our provider that your word says that you will pour out a blessing that cannot be contained and we choose in this moment to put you first in our hearts above our finances and we thank you uh, that ultimately your kingdom will come here on earth as it is in heaven amen Amen, amen. Amen, fantastic. But right now, church, we're gonna come around the Word of God. We have a message that was um, spoken by Steve Dixon at the Dominion Theatre a couple of weeks ago. I hope you're ready. Open your hearts and let's go from there. Have you ever broken a teacup, a glass, a vase, a wine glass? I don't know anything about wine, but what some people use wine glasses in life. But it's, um, it's not the greatest moment. It's not one of the greatest moments if it's valuable. Because you're thinking when that's gone to replace that, especially if it's like a unique object, like a vase or something, uh, or a memory. You know, if, if it's got dollar value, pound sterling value, then it hurts. But if it's the memory that has just been broken, because what has just been smashed means so much more to you, then that hurts a little bit more than a pound sterling value of something that's been broken. When we were in uh, Spain, I went to, I think it was Valencia for uh, a weekend to do some church stuff there. And one of the young guys from the church in Madrid where we were, he said, can I come with you? Can I do all the, the bits and pieces and do all the help? Yeah, sure, be great experience, come and do it. Now this guy was famous for making one or two mistakes in life. He was kind of a Mr. Bean, Christian version, 18 years of age, he, everybody loved him, but he kind of was good at breaking things and getting things wrong. And so here I am, 
taking him along to Valencia, and we get to the accommodation with his beautiful family in Spain that was accommodating us. Uh, their mother had passed away in the previous year, and so there's this wonderful dad with his kind of two or three daughters, I seem to remember, and they were so welcoming. Anyway, we, we go to the house, and they say to this guy, they say, I hope you don't mind, but we don't have like a bedroom for you, but if we put a mattress on the floor in the lounge, would that be cool? And of course, he'd be willing to do absolutely anything. He's a good lad. And he said, absolutely. We go out, we do the meetings, all of that's great. We come back to the house and uh, we have some food with this family and we go to bed and he goes off to his mattress in the lounge. And then like a really good, helpful human being that he always was, he decides to get up before anyone else, get the mattress and take it back to the room where it was taken from or the cupboard. And so all I hear as I'm lying in bed at six in the morning, not really wanting to get up at six o'clock, is <laughs> crack, snapple, crock, all that. And I open the door and he's got a mattress over his, uh, over his back and he's knocked off the photographs of the whole family's history of the mother, the father, and honestly, I just closed the door again and went back to bed <laughs> and just prayed for him that he'd survive this awful moment. And it was one of the most awful moments. The poor guy was devastated. I was devastated, not so much, it was his fault. But when we got to breakfast, not a word was said. But I gotta tell you, and I'm sure they replaced all the glass and got all the photos back, but it's an awful feeling when something is smashed that has greater value than dollars or than pounds, but it means so much. You know, when we break something, sometimes we think it's redeemable. And so we get out the super glue and we put that mug together again and that plate together again. And sometimes it kind of just about survives, although it doesn't look good. And sometimes what do we do? We throw it away because it's easier to get a new one than and to discard the old one than it is to have what you had originally. Now, what about us? What happens when someone is broken? What do we do with the someone? We try to fix them sometimes. In our, our own limited abilities, we try and encourage them and tell them it's gonna be all right when we don't actually know whether it's gonna be all right, but it's what we say as human beings. It just kind of trips off our tongue and we're just hoping to fix them and, and kind of put them back together again and get them to some semblance of where they were before the thing happened that actually caused them to feel broken. In some cases, we almost give up and we, we accept that they are never gonna be the same. They're never going to be that person. And we just relegate their future to a brokenness because we don't know how to put together somebody's life that has been broken. You know, sometimes people look at people in their own life and see a relationship that's broken and they don't know how to fix this. They've tried super glue in the relationship for a little while and that doesn't seem to work. And then unfortunately, we discard a person as we've discarded a plate. And we get a different model, a different view, a different person, a different relationship because it's just too hard to put right what has gone wrong. What about our own view of our own brokenness? This message gets lighter, don't worry about it. <laughs> you see, when you look at yourself, and you know the scars that you are carrying, but some of those scars, nobody else can see them, but you know them. You're scarred maybe in your spirit, maybe you're scarred in your mind and in your memory and in your thought life, you're scarred in so many ways. You're scarred and you're scared often about what the future looks like. You can't face the future. I'm unlovable, I'm unredeemable, I am the broken vase. The Bible talks about people in those circumstances. There's a beautiful phrase, which is only beautiful when you know what happens afterwards, but it's a challenging phrase at the beginning because it talks about the broken vessel, the broken vase. And it's a sad place, you'll find in Psalm 31, among other places, I, it's the person, it's not the plate, it's not the vase, it's not the valuable piece of something or other. 
I am forgotten like a dead man. That's a pretty desperate place to be. I am like a broken vessel. My life is not fit for the purpose for which it was created. I don't know the way forward because there's a brokenness inside. It's a terrible place to be. We weren't created to be broken. Listen to me. We were not created to be broken. We were created to be whole. That parent who is going through stuff, additional to what they already feel about themselves, can also feel broken about what they are offering their children because they want to be whole so they can be a better mom and be a better dad. Why? Because wholeness is normal. It's where we should be. It's where we can get back to if we see the way God looks at things. And so wholeness, not brokenness, is definitely the way forward. Now I'm going to educate you now. We've got any Japanese in the house. They never really shout very loud anyway, so even if it's very dark, I can't see a waved hand. But let me, uh, let me tell you about this. The Japanese have this craftsman, master craftsman, who does the art of what is known as kintsugi. Kintsugi is the art of restoring broken things. It means golden joinery or to patch with gold. And this, when I found out about this, I thought, you know, that just sounds exactly like the gospel to me. Because the custom, the ancient custom was to repair the cracked pottery. So you have smashed a beautiful vase and you get the super glue out, doesn't look great, bin, or straight to the bin. But the kintsugi approach is, that was a beautiful plate. Why would I throw away something relegating it to its past. Because if I can repair and restore what was a beautiful plate, and I can restore it with gold, and gold thread, and gold paint, not only has it got a past, it's now got a future, and not only has it got a future, it's more valuable than it ever was before it was broken. I can do something, he says, the Kintsugi craftsman, I can do something with what was beautiful, but has become broken, to make it not only beautiful again, but more beautiful than it was ever seen to be, and more valuable. You know, the more I've got to know Jesus over the years, the more I've realized that he doesn't do half a job. He doesn't just have empathy and feel sorry for us. He doesn't look at our disasters and traumas and our mistakes and, and our mattress action and just feel bad for us. It's like everything about the Lord is, is towards making us the best us that he can possibly have us to be. He's like the perfect dad the perfect father who's not limited in any way, perfectly just but f perfectly loving, perfect in wisdom, perfect in knowledge. He's forever, here we are with, with our kids trying to tell him a few things and show him. He's, he's left us information. He's left us revelation. And then by the Spirit of God, he can speak to us any moment of any day to help us out to do life and to see things and to see in the Spirit what we don't see with natural eyes and to understand things that we would have no way of knowing unless by the Spirit of God, he, he's there to help us and make us better us. He doesn't just pop people together with a bit of super glue. He makes the most beautiful artwork that he possibly can with every human being. So the title of these few thoughts is From a Broken to a Golden Vessel. You know, when we go through the nonsense, when we go through the mess, when we go through the stuff that kind of it's tough, it hurts, things went wrong. When we go through those things, it's factual to say that we don't come out of them unscarred. Because the Christian who's trying to pretend, tries to pretend that it doesn't hurt, it only hurts a little bit more a bit further down the road. But when you face the hurts as they are and realize what just happened actually did just happen, then you, you know that there is a scar, but you know that there is healing that is needed. Some things genuinely break down and you end up with an ability to, or you lose the ability to believe in others again or believe in yourself again or your hope is broken and tarnished. Relationships get disjointed and broken. 
your faith in God might end up broken. As long as you know that his faith in you never shifts an inch. Your faith in people might be not. Your faith in men. Your faith in a boss or bosses. Your faith in authority. Your, the, your faith in this generation. I mean, there's, we're not short of reasons in life because we're pretty good as human beings of not always doing the best for one another. But all of that can be factual. None of that has to be, you don't have to pretend that that is not true. We just have to face it eye to eye, eye to eye. We believe when the situation is beyond our own abilities to repair and to be redeemed, that God says to you tonight, nothing is too broken to be beautiful again. And I've been aware of wanting to speak this message for a few days now. I wanted to get on this platform and I've been praying that the right people will be in the room because tonight is a divine appointment between you and God. There's not much I can do apart from share a few words. But if you would just open up your heart and realize you are here tonight not out of fortune or luck or because it was on a roster or in your diary or it's what you did last week. You are here and some people, I dare to, to speak out, it's the first time you've been here and there's others the first time for a long while and you know already in the first five minutes of me speaking that this is your opportunity and your appointment with the future. Scars are scars. Let me tell you about my dad. My name's Steve Dixon. I found out when I was 40 I'm not a Dixon, but that's for another message and another day. But my dad, he told me his whole life that he was the only child. Sorry, he was one of uh, two, two children. And he, he's brought up by the Dixons, and so the Dixons were grandparents and all of this. But I found out four decades on that when he said that he was one of two brothers, that actually he'd been adopted by the Dixons. And the reason he'd been adopted is because at childbirth, his biological mother passed away giving birth to twins. She died and one twin. And so dad has now got nine children in the house, including a day old baby. And he's got no wife. And he's got the pain of not only losing her, but a, a baby at the same time in Manchester, England, way back then. And he hit the bottle. And after a few days, a few weeks, he literally walked out of the front door, closed the door and never came back again and left nine children inside, hoping that the authorities, neighbors, somebody would sort out the mess. And so my dad was one of nine. And yet he told me and everybody, including the wife, my mother, including her, that he was one of two, but he was actually one of nine. Why would you do that? For decades. You do that for decades because it hurts so bad when you were a little boy for all of that to happen in your world, nothing you can do about as a, I think he was a seven-year-old at the time. And he, it was the most awful experience. And so all the children are taken away in twos, apart from the middle one, which was my dad. So the middle kid, my dad, lost a mum, lost a dad, and eight siblings, and never saw six of them again. He saw two of them when he was in his 60s. And he vowed, as a little boy being taken on by the Dixons, I'm never gonna tell anybody about what happened. I'm never gonna tell anybody about having a, another mum and dad and brother. I start again from zero. That's a tough decision when you're seven years of age. And so he lived his whole life, got engaged, married my mom, and still never told her. Why? Because brokenness can be so tough and so strong. It can grip your mind and your heart and it can render you almost semi-incapacitated from making normal, clean, uncomplicated decisions in life. And it actually helped me to find out that story. I wasn't angry about it. I was grateful that I found out. It took me quite a few pints of beer that I bought him just to get the truth out, to be honest, in a Chinese restaurant one night. It was the way, the, the word of wisdom the Lord gave me, this is the way ahead. This is the way, just keep buying beer. Buying beer, you'll get the full story. Another one and you might get a little bit more. We got there. 
But you see, brokenness is an awful thing, and some of you know what it feels like. But the way forward is not to hide it. The way forward is not to change the story, is not to pretend that the history isn't real. It's to know how to live with the past in the present and for the future. And I want to help you tonight, and I'm believing that God's going to do it in just a few minutes. You know this thing about scars that we carry? There's a guy, we're going to show you another, an, an image up here. This guy is called John T. Almua. He's uh, a Pacific Islander. He's in our campus in Darwin, in Northern Territories of Australia. And uh, I'm responsible for those campuses. I know this guy really, really well. And um, when I met him a few years ago, um, I heard his story that he'd had a heart operation and then a few years later, he had another heart operation. And they don't usually go through two of these and do very well. And then he was going in for a third one. And we're all praying for him as he's literally got to get a plane from Darwin to one of the biggest cities for the, for the best treatments and, and operations and so forth. He's a walking miracle, this guy. But look at him. He's a good-looking good rooster, isn't he? He's not, not a bad-looking lad. But you see, that he was telling me the story how... You know, he'd go to the beach, which he loves the beach, and he'd had his operations, and for the next year or two, he'd wear a T-shirt and kind of hide it away because he didn't want anyone to see the scar until the Lord said to him, are you embarrassed about what I've just done for you? God's done a miracle. Everybody knows he should not be alive with the severity of what he's gone through. And, uh, and then he goes to the beach one day, and it was a faith step for him. It was a big deal for him. He was broken with all this shame and, and embarrassment and all this sort of a stuff, and yet that scar to him represented God had brought me through one and two and three. And so he took his shirt off, and you know, within two or three minutes, some kid, you know, kids are pretty honest, aren't they? Some kid walks past me and says, hey, mister, what's that? What's that on your belly? What's that on your chest? And he's now explaining to them that Jesus, who he prays to, has three times saved him when he was told that it was very uh, limited, the possibilities he had of survival. And he's witness to another one, and to another one, and to another one, and to another one. And he's become somebody who has used the scars of what he has been through, literally, to be able to tell a story of the goodness of God. That guy, last time we were up there, was on the keyboards leading worship. God is good. Don't hide the scars that you go through. Just learn how to work with them and then live a life going, going forward. You know, the Kintsugi potter is a master craftsman, but God is a master life restorer. He doesn't glue us together. He makes something so beautiful of us. He will never just fix the edges. He won't just fix a little bit of us. He won't fix us in a way that with the next conversation we can be broken. I can tell you stories about my dad. I can tell you stories about other crazy stuff that's happened in life. But I can tell you the story because I don't have to pretend it wasn't there. I don't have to worry about not being a Dixon. It doesn't change my security. I know who my God is. I know who my faith is in. I know who my, I love my wife. I love my children. It doesn't matter what name you call me. The security, the security is total when that relationship with God is intact. Your scars won't need to be painted with gold. But when Jesus anoints the scars of our life, there becomes such a healing something that is so freeing, something that is so new and fresh. There's a weight comes off your shoulder. There's a clarity comes to your mind. There's an ability to talk about stuff that before you couldn't even get the words out because it hurts so much. I've come to tell some people tonight that this is your night. This is the night. And for every single one of us, all, even if you just remember the word kintsugi, write it on your phone, because at some time you'll be talking to someone who's broken, and they just need to know that it's not a Japanese craftsman that can heal them, but the gospel does that and so much more. See, jo Jesus himself knows all about brokenness and scars. Garden of Gethsemane, imagine the agony. Preached on it so many times because I just cannot imagine what it felt like for Jesus to be there knowing what was coming in his humanity, the agony and the thought of, of what he would face. And, and, and there he is just 
you know, you could only go so far with some people. And he went as far as he could with his closest disciples and then said, boys, you just need to stay here and pray. They didn't do very well with that, by the way. But you need to, just, because I just need to go a few steps further. And when he went a few steps further into the Garden of Gethsemane, he knew what brokenness was. He knew when he'd empty himself, he would lay down literally his will to say, God, whatever I've got to do, okay, I'm going to do this. You know, for some of you, you need to take those last few steps tonight. People can bring you as far as they can bring you. They can, uh, can accompany you with. They could even be more successful at praying for you than the disciples were. But you might need to take your last steps yourself and get before the Lord tonight and say, I'm here. I'm going to empty myself of my own wishes and desire. I, I really just need some help tonight to be able to face going forward. And then he's the one that was on the cross of Calvary. They pierced his side. They pinned nails into his hand and his other and his feet. That's not nice. That was the humanity of Jesus. That was the physical being. That wasn't a pretend God. That was Jesus of Nazareth at 33 years of age, willing to take some pain for the greater good, which includes you and me. He was agonizing for humanity, not just for his own pain. And I think we can safely say that he knows what pain is like. He knows what it is to be rejected, to be spoken down to, to be criticized. He knows what it is for people to mock him, even in a cross in all, well, he's carrying all of that agony. He knows what it is to be betrayed by the disciples that have, he's just poured himself into for three and a half years. He knows what it's like to stand in a court of law with Pilate and he's saying, well, I don't want to try this guy. Send him to Herod Antipas and he listens to him and he says, no, 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 send him back to Pilate over here and Pilate makes a decision based upon the will of a crowd and you're the one, your life is in the hand of a will of a baying crowd. So when people have talked us down and people have criticized us and somebody at work has done the wrong thing and said the wrong thing and all that type of thing, just realize tonight before we can't bring this to a close that I reckon it's fair to say that Jesus has been through way more than we have probably had in our lives. John chapter 20, I love this. Any, any story about an imperfect disciple encourages me because it means we're all in. We've all got a chance. This is about Thomas. Don't you love Thomas? Now, Thomas, also known as Didymus. Now, that's got to be one of the best names I've ever heard in the Bible. Anybody want to name their baby Didymus? Nope. One of the 12 was not with the disciples when Jesus came. Don't miss church next week. Jesus might turn up. Thomas wasn't there. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks, the scars, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. What a statement from a disciple. This is after three and a half years of wandering around Galilee, watching and listening to Jesus. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them, finally. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger in here. See my hands? Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. It's like he's not ignoring what is actually the truth. It's just this is what it is. The scars are part of life. The, 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 the nails into it was all part of what had to happen. It's okay. It's all right. Be at peace. I'm at peace, and I'm the one that suffered all of this. So be at peace. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Finally, he got it, but he had to see something first. And Jesus said to him, because you've seen me, you've believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have, be, have believed. So where are you, my friend, tonight? Do you find it easy to believe in God? Do you find it easy to believe in Jesus? Or are there doubts and questions? You know what? Look at the way Jesus handled Tim, uh, Thomas. He never puts anybody down. It's like you've got questions. Come on, Thomas, just ask me the question, son. It's okay. But you don't believe that I was the guy on the... You don't believe, put your hand in here. It's okay. Test it out. 
try it out. I mean, just, just work this out for yourself one way or another. Maybe you find it easy to believe. Maybe you're struggling to believe. There might be somebody on your row that is desperately trying to just get their mind around some of the things to do with faith and God and, and Jesus and the historicity of it and all that type of thing. And the person sitting next to them is just thinking, this is the most beautiful experience. You, you know, you just pray for me and I'll be healed. You just, you just tell me that a good thing for me to do this way. I'm just going to go out there and do that because I'm just, it's just simple and straightforward. We are all unique and we are all different. And I also want to tell you tonight where you are, my friend, is legit. Jesus doesn't judge us for our questions, doesn't judge us for a few doubts along the way, but he takes us to where we need to come to some faith. You will not get out of brokenness. You will not heal those scars just by refusing to open a new page in your life. And tonight, you have that opportunity. I want to speak the word of God over people in this place tonight. I think, let's get the band up actually. I think I'd like to read some scripture over you so that you know for the rest, the last two or three minutes of this message that what is being spoken to you isn't Steve's words. This is what the Bible says, what God says over your life. And so if you are in a place where you need God to come through, Maybe you're broken hearted. What you feel can't be dealt with with medication. Possibly can't even be successfully fully dealt with by somebody counseling and talking to you. Words don't seem to have been able to fix it even though you've tried. Maybe it's broken dreams. When you just had so much aspiration for life and you're here tonight on this Sunday night of the whatever date it is in January and you think, well, it didn't pan out. It didn't work out. I need you to know tonight that a broken dream in the hands of God can be a fulfilled dream and a bigger dream than you ever had in the beginning anyway. But you need to be willing to write a new page. What about broken relationally? You can't see how you're going to get over the brokenness of the relationship. My, my mom's been divorced from my dad, and then she married another guy who liked the bottle too much, and that ended up in divorce as well. And when she looks back in, you even use the word marriage, or you use the word divorce, it just brings up all of this disappointment. But she became a believer in Jesus. And if you see her now, she's not young, obviously, now, but you'll see someone who, she, you know, so much stuff has been thrown at her. She had bowel cancer two years ago. She's got this going on. She's got the other thing going on. She's, she's been on her own for like a few decades now. She's basically house ridden. And you go in there, there's a smile on her face. She's singing a song. You know, when they take her to the hospital for checkups, the hospital now ask her to stay and go the wheel around to talk to the other cancer patients to encourage them because she's got such brightness in her spirit. And that's somebody who's gone through two very tough situations in the past, but there is a future, my friend. There is a future that you don't need to know how it's gonna work out. You just need to know there's somebody that's gonna help you get there. Maybe it's your broken spirit that's the problem. You feel like giving up. I remember praying for a lady in England, actually. I think it was Slough, and a lady came and she said, Steve, I'd love you to pray for me. She said, I'm just, I've fallen into depression. And th this was a woman who, was, who loved to pray, loved church, all her sons were in the church and serving God. And, and like a, a wonderful Christian woman, yet somehow she'd done a little bit of this. I remember her sitting in this office in an armchair and she's telling me all this. She says, I can't work it out. I'm, I should be better than this. I shouldn't, have, I shouldn't have allowed. I don't know how this is. It's just crept up on me. I don't know what to do. I feel like there's darkness there instead of light. I just don't get what is going on. And I said to her, and she said, would you pray for me and fix this? I said, I can't fix this for you, Sandra. She says, but what you need to do from that armchair, I'll pray for you when you stand up. She said, what do you mean? I said, you, you, you make this step of faith. You, you, you decide, Lord, I'm standing up as a sign of I want to go forward in life. You know what? It took her 20 minutes to get out of the armchair. She would have the arm, on the arm, she'd be getting up, she'd say, I can't do it, I can't do it, I can't do it, Steve. 20 minutes is a long time. But the moment she got up, 
the moment she got up. Floods of tears, then joy, then freedom, and never went back to shadow or to darkness ever again. But somebody has to stand up. Somebody has to stand up and say, Lord, I'm ready. I've got, I've got to break this cycle because I I'm not going to continue in this. This stuff that has happened to us as people, as individuals, as marriages, but here's the breakthrough moment for so many people. If you'll just say, tonight, Lord, I'm going to do it. So you ready for those scriptures? Why don't you close your eyes? We got a band? Good looking band, at least three of them. Anyway, come on, come on, guys. And you guys can take over for a few minutes. This is what the Word of God says. Are you ready? Just close your eyes. Psalm 147, He heals the brokenhearted and He binds up their wounds. Ecclesiastes 3 says, He has made everything beautiful in its time. Revelation 21 says, Behold, I make all things new. 2 Corinthians 5 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. That's tonight. Isaiah 43 says, Behold, I will do a new thing. Now, tonight, it shall spring forth. Do you not perceive it? I will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert for you. And Isaiah 41 says, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous hand. And so, Lord, I pray for these amazing people in this auditorium tonight. I pray every one of us would understand the power of your gospel, the beauty that you can bring forth from something that has been broken. I pray tonight that broken vessels would go out of this place as golden vessels, knowing that they are no longer broken, no longer in pieces. They have the scars to prove where they have come from, but they are free in spirit and in soul, in, in body. I pray, Lord, that they would be golden in terms of value. They would know that they are loved. They would know that you value nobody greater than you value each individual in this place. Lord, we declare tonight that you don't make broken vessels, you mend broken vessels. We declare tonight that you make golden vessels out of broken vessels. And so we believe as we sing and as we stand before you, Lord, that you would begin to do something tonight that would change our days and our future in the name of Jesus. Everybody said amen. Only stand up if it's your declaration as we sing this song that here I am, Lord, I'm gonna live a life as a golden vessel, no longer broken. If it takes you to stand up, if there's a battle going on, have the battle, just make sure you win it and get to your feet before God in Jesus' name. In the quiet, in the stillness I know that you are God in the secret of your presence I know there I am restored when
So before we end this service, we'd love to spend a bit of time talking to some of you specifically out there. Throughout the service, we've been hearing about this name of Jesus. And Steve Dixon was talking so beautifully about how Jesus makes things that were broken beautiful and he restores. And if you're sat there now thinking you don't know who Jesus is, or you're feeling far from Jesus, you have no idea who God is, we'd love to encourage you right now and lead you in a really simple prayer. See, the thing is, we were all born to have a relationship with God. And because of decisions man made, we end up having a separation from God. And that grieved his heart so much. So he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to be that bridge between us and to restore us back into relationship with God. And because of sin, Jesus had to pay a penalty, which was him being crucified on a cross, but being resurrected three days later. And there's so much more I could say about this, but ultimately it's about us in our hearts recognizing our need of our Savior, our need of a Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So you're sat there right now and your heart is beating and you're thinking, that is me. And I'd love to lead you in a prayer. And the words themselves are not significant. It's about your heart's condition, your heart position. So please pray with me, repeat these words with me if you will. Dear Jesus, I'm sorry for the sin in my life. I recognize my need of you and I want to be in right relationship with you. Please come into my life. I accept your gift of grace. And Lord, I want to be a follower of you the remaining days of my life. In your name we pray, amen. Amen, amen, so exciting. Um, and I just want you to know if you're out there and you've made that decision, we are celebrating with you. And the Bible says that heaven is celebrating with you as well. And if I am talking to you and you're one of those people who made that decision today, uh, we wanna help you with some really easy, practical next steps. And the first one of those is just the fact that being a Christian, doing this life with Jesus, you're not supposed to do it alone. We were created to do this journey in community with other people in the church. Uh, and so if you live near any of our locations, let me encourage you, go along. You can see where all of those locations are on our website. Uh, and also, why, why not join a group, get involved? And it's not even about just attending a Sunday service. And our small groups, they're a space where you can actually make real authentic friends away from the bigger Sunday service, people that you can actually do life with day to day. Um, those are really great first steps uh, and otherwise if you don't live near any of our locations let me just encourage you find a Christ-centered Bible-based church near you get plugged in and watch your journey with Jesus go from strength to strength. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us at church today and we hope you have found something in our service that has blessed your life. You have encountered Jesus as well and we just want to pray right now before we go into our week ahead. So please pray with me. Dear Jesus, we thank you for who you are and we thank you that we get to be your sons and daughters. Lord, I pray that as we go into our Mondays, Tuesdays and beyond, your spirit continues to go with us. That Lord, we the church will be a, an, an example of light and love and mercy in our conversations, in our relationships, in our workplaces. And God, we join again next week and celebrate your name, the name that is above all names. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. See you next week. Amen. Don't know why I just did that. Ha 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 ha!